All right. Well, I'm so very glad to see so many of you back. That's a good. That's always a good sign. We. I know we have some. There's some from the Filipino. They. Uh, they told. They were just leaving not too long ago. So, we'll probably not see them. I told them it's okay. I don't take it personally. Um, <clears throat> let me go over just a few things that'll. Uh, different announcements and things that'll be a help to us. Um, the, the the class from last week did get, it is uploaded. Um, and then Pastor Jesse went away. We, we're going to figure out the best way to, um, where to publish the links, okay? Um, so uh, they'll be on the YouTube page, and that we'll be sending out links, and you'll be able to access them, uh, you know, at your, if you miss one, or if you want to go back and uh, you know, review something or something like that, then, uh, then those will be available. Again, sometimes it takes a week or two to work out the, the mechanism and things like that, okay? Um, and then, uh, don't forget, if you, there, there was a few, if you, I know last week was kind of uh, just introductory, but don't forget, as we go along, if you have questions, feel free to uh, call me, text me, send them to my email, um, I'd be happy to address those. Now, um, I want to deal with just a couple of things. I had some uh, feedback. I'm always open to feedback, um, good and bad. It's all, it's all good if we can uh, find a way to make things better. Um, so a couple people remarked, you know, it's a lot, right? The first two weeks were a lot, we, and, uh, combined with the, the, the message that I preached and then last week, just a lot of information. So don't be discouraged by that. Um, after this, we're going, to, we're going to be kind of global picture once again, although we'll begin to home in tonight. Um, but then once, once we're past that, we're just trying to get everybody on the same page, as you would say, um, kind of same base of knowledge to move forward. But it, it will be, each, each uh, lesson will be fairly focused, okay? We'll be going through uh, probably each night a single chapter. And so we'll be focused on that. We'll pull in a lot of different issues, apply what we're looking at to, you know, to other places in the scriptures, but it won't be just like this, you know, just ton of information coming down on you uh, like it's been so far, okay? So don't be discouraged by that. A couple others said, uh, going through Amos, uh, maybe you, how many would say, uh, I've read some of Amos and I find it pretty, the word used was heavy, okay? Pretty heavy. Um, Amos, I mentioned to you, Amos was direct fella, okay? Um, he didn't know how to do things other way. Like I said, he wasn't one of these sophisticated guys, and that's one of his charms, okay? Um, and it is, it is heavy reading. Um, but what I want us to see, okay? How many of you find sometimes life is heavy? Life can be pretty heavy, right? And sometimes life lands on you. Um, what do we do? So we're going we're to look in Amos, and we're going to find tools, and we're going to find things when we go to the scriptures. And so what do we do when things are heavy? What do we do when we read a book that's heavy? What do we do when we face a situation that's heavy? Well, let's find out um, tools, ways that we can go about um, alleviating some of that, and how in the midst of a heavy reading, we can find the pinpoints of light. Does that make sense? And, and that's, what we, that's one of the things that we're going to do. Um, I know I've, I've read Jeremiah through many, many times, okay? I don't know if there's a heavier book in the whole, in the whole Bible. And yet, even as Pastor preached uh, maybe a month or so, six weeks ago, uh, uh, from Jeremiah, I mean, in the midst of a just, you know, just awful chapter, just an awful uh, story of what was going on, bam, there's this verse that just explodes in front of you and, you know, kept, kept Jeremiah going. And, you know, it's what can keep us going and keep us encouraged when things are difficult and heavy. So we want to learn, again, as I mentioned this, we want to learn to mine the books that we're looking at and, and to sometimes refine things, right, to find the joy. And uh, for, for those of you that are familiar with the book of Habakkuk, that's, that's exactly what you have. I mean, you basically have three chapters of just bleh, and then the last couple of verses are just like, yes! And I mean, it makes the whole process worth it, okay? And so we want to we find out how to do that and, and do that 
uh, more efficiently and more effectively, okay? Um, do you have your study aids handy? Okay, you want to keep those? Paper and pencil, okay? Now, let me just remind you of a couple different uh, things that are important. Remember, we're, we're not after every single detail. We're, we're hunting down themes, right? We're, we're trying to make connections. Uh, we're trying to build upon knowledge that we already possess and then try and, you know, uh, move forward in some areas where we don't know a lot of other things. We want to link stories together. We want to link people together. We want to link books together. We want to put the Old and New Testament together. We want to understand the whole thing because the whole thing is about Jesus, okay? And so in that same light, be careful not to get bogged down into too much detail. Or again, as I mentioned in the beginning, don't get discouraged by too much detail, okay? It, it, uh, I agree with you. It's a lot that we've covered. And then as, as I mentioned before, always be looking for our Savior. Always be looking for Jesus. Remember the verse that we looked at last week, Luke 24, 27, when he was talking to the disciples on the Emmaus Road, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, okay? He's there, and, uh, and he's what we're all about. And the more we're able to find him in the Bible, okay, the more we can find him, the, the better the book is for us and the more resourceful it becomes for us, okay? And, and when we have more resources, you know, and it provides more resources for us, we're more likely to turn there, aren't we, uh, when we have a need, okay? So let's pray, and then we'll jump into a discussion. Uh, beginning tonight, we're going to talk about, just in general, prophets in Israel, okay? Father, thank you for the day and your love for us. Thank you for good services today, and what a blessing the Filipino service was as well. And now we uh, turn our attention to you and to this book of Amos, and we ask you to uh, help it, help unfold it before our eyes. Help us to uh, maybe see uh, real value in a place that we, we weren't able to see it before. Lord, every person here, probably many here for similar reasons, but a lot of us are here for our own personal reasons, Lord, our own, our own personal desires or, or, or hopes for this class. And Father, I pray that you would meet those. I pray that your spirit would, would help us to, to grow uh, more fully in the knowledge and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we love and pray in his name. Amen. <clears throat> all right, we want to talk, first of all, uh, this evening about prophets in Israel, okay? Obviously, Amos was a prophet, okay? But there were a lot of prophets in Israel throughout their history. Many people in the scripture are referred to as prophets, or they were not called a prophet, but they were obviously engaged in prophetic work. Um, it's not limited to the ones we call, you know, the ones that are in here we call the writing prophets, okay? They're, that's what they're known as, because they left us a written record. Uh, Abraham is called a prophet, okay? You can look at the scriptures and find Abraham. Moses, of course, he's also called a prophet, but he, he wrote, uh, you know, numerous books. Uh, Elijah, of course, is called a prophet. We all know Nathan, the one that approached David, right, and said, thou art the man. He was a prophet. How about some ladies? There were some numerous prophetesses in the Bible. Now, sometimes the prophetess was the prophet's wife, okay, uh, as in the case of like Isaiah, okay, uh, but other times, it was clear these women were engaged in some kind of prophetic ministry. We all know Deborah, right? Deborah that, okay, with jail with the nail, right? Okay, Deborah, that story. Uh, Miriam, Moses' uh, sister, was called a prophet. There's a lady called, several times you'll find her name, Hulda uh, was a lady. And, and how about in the New Testament? Um, Anna. The one that saw the Lord Jesus Christ, she's described as a, as a prophetess, okay? So we see these all over. And there were many other people that were referred to as prophets or engaged in some type of prophetic ministry. Now, these played important roles in delivering oral messages to leaders or kings or to God's people. Now, I want you to look at, real quick with me, um, we'll look, look at quite a bit more scripture tonight than, than last week. Let's look in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 24, 2 Samuel 24. This is the story where uh, toward the end of David's 
uh, life, toward the end of his reign, he decided that he was going to uh, have a census, count the people, right? And he sinned in doing that. He was told, don't do that, it's a bad idea, it's your pride, he did it anyway. And he was offered several different punishments for the people. Of course, he chose uh, a, a plague, the people to be afflicted with a plague. And so we find in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 11, for when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Okay, so there's a prophet named Gad. We don't have a book of Gad. There's no, you know, there's no life story of Gad, but we know he was a prophet, and he was called to give a message, in fact, several times, to David. Uh, look with me in 1 Kings, just not too much further down, 1 Kings chapter 11. We encounter another one. <clears throat> in verse 29, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 29. And it came to pass at the time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, Shilonite, found him in the way, and he had clad himself with a new garment, and they too were alone in the field. Okay? And so he comes and he uh, grabs the garment and tears him, and he's, gonna give, he's given a pre prophetic message through an action. Okay? But again, just an example of another person in the scriptures that delivered a message to a king uh, but we, we don't have a writing of him. We have him written of, but he wasn't a writer. He was an oral prophet. Now, interestingly, during this period of time, there was also a school of the prophets. How many of you are familiar with the school of the prophets? Okay, uh, Many times they are referred to as the sons of the prophets. Now, you know when uh, Elijah uh, was, uh, um, had his you know, battle with Ahab on the Mount Carmel, he ran away, right? And God said, go back and do the work you're supposed to do. Well, one of the things that he did was start a school of prophets, and he began to train prophets. And you'll find several stories of him uh, involved in training, uh, you know, these different prophets. In 2 Kings chapter 2, in verse number 3, uh, he's getting ready to be translated, to be taken up to heaven, and Elisha's going to take over, right? Take over in his place. And so the Bible tells us, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, in verse number 3, Then the sons of the prophet who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you, know to, uh, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know, be still. So we have this reference to the sons of the prophets, and these were uh, young men that were uh, being trained in this school of the prophets. So there's this period of time where there were uh, regular uh, places where prophets were trained, trained in the Word of God, certainly trained in communicating the Word of God, certainly involved in prayer, and they were a way that God could have, you know, have a pool of men that would, you know, prophesy for him and preach for him and teach for him and <clears throat> uh, generally communicate the Word of God. There's also, uh, in the Scriptures, Several other terms for prophets, okay? They were referred to by other terms in the scriptures. One of those terms in 1 Samuel 9 and verse 9, this refers to Samuel himself, uh, Saul and some others. He went to go try and find his donkeys, right? And uh, they said, you know, uh, go over to this place and you'll find uh, the seer, S-E-E-R, like seer, okay? And, and so in early Israel, your Bible probably has a little parenthesis or note to that. Prophets in this time were called seers, okay? They were also referred to in various places as men of God. In that same spot, we find uh, Samuel being referred to as a man of God. Uh, you find it as well in 1 Kings 17, 18, and, and numerous other places. They were also called the servants of God. And there's a couple references that are given. Uh, we won't take the time to look at those, but... Again, just another, uh, another uh, name that you might encounter uh, that refers to a prophet. I do want to look in uh, Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse number 19. We see another um, appellation, another word that's used in conjunction uh, for prophet. Uh, Isaiah chapter 42 and verse number 19. Who is blind but my servant? or death as my messenger that I sent. Okay, so another word we see that describes 
and you'll find it other places in the scriptures, prophets were messengers for God. And then uh, another one that you're probably familiar with, probably heard messages preached upon this. Look with me in Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. And in verse 17, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman. Okay, we've heard a message before on being a watchman. Okay, uh, prophets were referred to in various places, particularly in Ezekiel, as watchmen. I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. And then if you jump up in, in chapter 37 of uh, the same book, Ezekiel 30, uh, 30, uh, I'm sorry, 33, Ezekiel 33, verse 7. Ezekiel 33, verse 7, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Okay? So all of these were different words uh, that the scriptures use. Use some of them at different times, periods of time in the Bible. But they all describe the same uh, person or, you know, the work that they were doing. They were prophets. Okay? Now, we saw just a moment ago, even in, even in the verses we just read, that these individuals, these prophets, were to communicate God's word to God's people. Okay? Uh, in a sense, we, we know the term today, we say uh, the term, you know, that person's the, that he's the spokesman for this product or this organization or something like that. If you think about Moses, right? Moses said, I can't talk. So basically God said, okay, Aaron will be your spokesman. He'll do the talking for you. So the prophets did the talking for God. They were the spokesmen, okay? And I want you to look. There's a very important verse that we find in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay, so these individuals served as God's spokesmen, and, and we see at times the Bible would say, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, and they prophesied. The Spirit, you know, spoke uh, to them, and they, and they prophesied. Numerous times we find that uh, kind of expression or expressions that are similar. Uh, the Spirit would come upon these men, and they would speak in the place of God. And they, and they had a message to share. And um, a lot of times, when we think of prophets, we think of kind of doomy stuff, right? Okay, like, okay. And, you know, some of what they, what they uh, prophesied was doom and gloom. Uh, we won't get into it in a great deal in Amos itself, but you can read, though, many times, we will, we will deal with this later, Many times, uh, the, you know, I mentioned the prophetic formula, right? They would pronounce, you know, judgment. You know, they would say repent and then judgment. And then they would give promises of what was to come. So uh, we don't really see much of that in Amos. But a lot of times the prophets had, you know, good messages attached as well. Okay, we'll talk about another aspect of what they did. But they had a message to share. And look with me in Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20. And verse number seven. And these verses are probably familiar with to you. Um, this just shows us, you know, the power of the, uh, of the working of God within, so within these people, inside of these people. Okay, Jeremiah 20 uh, and verse number seven. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily, every one mocketh me. This is the prophet Jeremiah. He's not happy, in a sense, with what God's got him doing. You understand that? Uh, we get like that too, don't we? We're not always like thrilled with what God's doing uh, around us or in us or, or to us. Okay? For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil. Because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. He's trying to do the work of God. He's trying to be God's spokesman, and it's not working out so great for him personally. And so he decides, I'm done, right? I'm done. I've had enough of this preaching. I've had enough of the being mocked and derided and, and having people say things to me. 
you know, following God is making me look like a fool every day, and so I'm done. Then I said in verse number 9, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stand. The Spirit of God was working so powerfully in him. The Word of God was, 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 you know, was so uh, 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 on fire inside him that even after making a decision that he was going to stop, he could not. And, that, and that's one of the great things about these prophets. They, they suffered a lot. Some of them gave their lives. And, and, and yet, um, even when they wanted to stop, they couldn't because they were so filled with the Spirit of God. Okay? And so we'll, we'll read a passage uh, as we study from Amos. I don't want to take too much of the thunder away, but we'll read a passage later about Amos that just, you know, really underscores what, what, you know, what was moving inside him, how the Spirit of God was leading him, and, and what he was willing to, um, you know, give up uh, to follow God. And then, of course, we know Jonah, you know, Jonah that, that ran from God, but eventually, I mean, God, was, God had to put him on the mat, didn't he? But he wound up going and doing uh, the work of God. And I, and I want you to re, you know, know something. I think I mentioned it this last week. The people Jonah went to are the people that are going to destroy Israel in the future. The very people that Amos is going to prophesy about are the very people that are going to come and destroy the northern kingdom. Jonah was sent to them. And so what happened was that judgment was pushed off because they had revival. But not only was the judgment pushed off because they had revival, God gave them more years to potentially repent. Be careful when people tell you, they read the Old Testament, they, or even you and I think it sometimes. Boy, God, you know, he, all, he, all he wants to do is punish us, even in the Old Testament. Think about the time of Noah, how long he waited. I'm going to show you a verse in just a little bit. You know, people are like, how could God, you know, tell them to go in there and destroy all the Canaanites? That's just evil. How could God do that? God gave them centuries to repent. He gave them the witness of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He gave them the witness of, from far away of Joseph. And then he gave them centuries to do something with the message. And so honestly, by the time Joshua got there, They'd had centuries to repent. And instead of doing that, they just got more wicked. Our, our God's long-suffering, as I, I was preaching in the Filipino service today, he's not willing that any should perish. He gives days and weeks and months and years and decades and centuries and millennia to men and women to repent. He's not a God that's just looking to wipe people off the map. He loves us. And his default mode is save people that repent. It is only when people with stiff necks and uncircumcised hearts refuse his goodness that eventually, even if they're his own people, he has to bring judgment. So these, they had a message to share. Now we talked also about the fact that these prophets didn't always understand what they were sharing. Remember we talked last week about the double prophecies and the telescopic prophecies. We mentioned uh, references to the Messiah, and they weren't always, they didn't even always see those. Again, sometimes those messianic references are pretty clear. Other times they're fairly veiled, and they're not completely able to see that. Now I want to show you something else that uh, I could get these spread out. That'd be real good. Just take them and pass them however. <laughs> There's a very important other thing that we need to understand when we deal with the prophets. The prophets, if we could flip that over uh, to the next one. The prophets were not able to see our age. They, they didn't know about the church. They didn't understand this gap in, in time of, you know, at this point, over 2,000 years. So if you look, here's the prophet, right? And he's looking 
and he can see Calvary. He knows the Messiah is coming. He understands Messiah is going to die, etc., etc. And he can see, you know, the second coming. He knows about the kingdom. Many of the prophets uh, preached about the kingdom. He understands. And again, we're so blessed to live in the New Testament. We got the whole picture, right? They could see these things. That's why the Bible talks about in, in Corinthians, I, I see through a glass darkly, right? We can't see completely. They had kind of a, you know, I mentioned last week the impressionistic painting. You know, you could kind of just see the, you know, you could tell what it is, but it's not clarity. That was them. Okay, they had, they had an impression. They knew, you know, the big outlines. They knew what was going to happen, but they didn't know all the details like we did. But one thing they could not see, one thing they absolutely could not imagine was the Gentile church. They could, it just didn't make sense to them. It was impossible for them to understand that there was going to be a period of time where their privilege as Jewish people was going to be taken away. And they were going to sojourn on the earth among the nations for several thousand years. And God was going to, you know, where it talks in Romans, it talks in, in Isaiah, he was going to, you know, take them off the natural tree. He was going to, you know, take them off and he was going to graft in the Gentiles to the tree. And the reason is because he had, he had done everything for them and he had planted them and, and he had, you know, fertilized everything and he gave them water and he expected nice grapes, and the Bible says he got wild grapes instead. And so what happens is God removes them and he grafts you and I in, the Gentiles, into that tree. And we've been growing that tree now for 2,000 years. And so if you look at that kind of, you can see the prophet, you can see how he sees, but he can't see the valley of the church. And it's very important for us to understand when we study the prophets and the other people in the Old Testament to understand that they didn't see things and they didn't have all the knowledge that we do. Now, I've thought about this many times. I'm really curious. You know, we're the beneficiaries of thousands of years of people studying the Bible and, you know, getting doctrine right. And, you know. But I'm really curious because I got a feeling we're going to get to heaven and we're going to find out we missed a few things just like they did. I'm really curious, you know, what we think we're so right about that we're going to find out that we're just not uh, you know, we just didn't, we didn't nail it like we think we did. And you know, that's important. I think that's an important thing for us to keep in our mind. You know why? Because that keeps us humble. It's dangerous when we think we know everything. That was the Pharisees, right? They were so certain. They were so sure of themselves that they couldn't even recognize Jesus Christ, the Messiah, in front of them. Just so certain. And let's be careful. Let's be careful to, to, walk, to, to, to beat down that pride in us. Because that pride at times can prevent us from seeing and applying the scriptures properly to our lives. So they couldn't see uh, that, that valley. But they did see the rest. And praise God, we'll talk about things that they, that they seen. But it's important for us not to, to, to attribute to the prophets and expect them to know and see things that they were not able to. I want you to look with me in, in this same light. Let me show you a couple verses that uh, help us to understand that, even uh, during Christ's ministry and, and beyond. Look with me in Luke chapter 19 and verse number 11. Luke 19, 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and, and catch this last part. And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. That was their expectation, right? Jesus was going to come. They didn't know he was going to come, you know, after the church and all that. Jesus knew all that, but they didn't. So all of their thinking and all of their mindset and even their actions were all based on the certainty that Jesus was going to set up his kingdom. He, he came here to do that, and he certainly did. But they didn't get the part about him rejecting and him coming a second time. So they, uh, they thought it was going to happen. Look with me up into Acts chapter 1. Now they have very familiar verses here. Acts chapter 1. And we see, <clears throat> beginning in verse number 6, 
when they therefore, Jesus has uh, been crucified, he's raised again, he's been, you know, uh, traveling and teaching them, eating with them, etc., for 40 days. When they therefore, in verse 6, were come together, they asked of him, saying, look what they were saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So even after, uh, you know, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, they thought, okay, you know, okay, we got that part out of the way now. <laughs> now let's just get to this kingdom stuff. They weren't able, they didn't understand it. They didn't know uh, how long or that there was going to be this period of time. We do that. We do know we're living in the midst of it. Now, another thing that's important to understand is although they prophesied, okay, and there's two couple of terms that are important. Uh, a prophet is someone who would for tell things, okay? So they tell things before, right? We've, when we think of prophesying, prophecies, we think of, you know, looking back and they were predicting, in a sense, things that were going to happen, right? So that's what prophets did, okay? They, uh, they prophesied, foretold many things. But I want us to understand at the same time that most of what they spoke was for the people they were speaking to. You and I like all the prophecies. It's cool. It's super cool to, you know, look at some of the prophecies and in the, in the space of one book to see the prophet say something and then, you know, it comes true later on. That's, a, that's exciting to see. It's exciting, you know, it's exciting to know how many prophecies are left to be fulfilled. And one of the important things that we, that we need to take away from the Old Testament and, and in looking at those prophesi prophecies prophesied, is to see how many have come true. And you know what that serves for us in? To convince us and to make us know, if God kept all of these ones, he's certainly capable of keeping all the ones that are still to come, right? And so that, that, that's one reason, that, you know, where I, I spoke last week, and I said the scriptures are, 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 are given to us to give us hope, right? Hey, there's some great prophecies. I mean, there have been a lot of Bible prophecies. There's some great ones still to come. And we ought to read the Old Testament and have hope and encouragement uh, that God is going to do, finish all the rest that still, uh, you know, have remained to be accomplished. But again, although they prophesied, foretold things, most of what they spoke was for people in their time period. So in reality, most of what they did was what we call today preaching, okay? So they were prophets who prophesied, but they were preachers who preached, okay? And that's important to understand. Finally, these prophets came from all levels of society. If you read Hosea, read a little of his background, Zechariah, these men were both, they were priests. They were people that were, uh, you know, among the uh, tribe of Levi, they were priests. Amos was a simple herdsman and farmer. And that's important to us to, to recognize and appreciate and be reminded of that God desires to use every single believer. Uh, he, he, has, he has you wherever you are for a reason. He has a ministry wherever he places you, in the workplace, in your family, wherever you, you know, have fellowship or associate, uh, you know, sports you may play in. He has a ministry for you, a scene of ministry, and he's preparing you uniquely for that, whether you're full-time or whether you're a lay person. Now, let's change complete tracks, and let's talk now about the Bible, all right? Let's talk, in fact, about the divisions of the Hebrew Bible. Now, we all understand that the Jewish people do not accept the New Testament. Do we all know that? They don't, they don't believe the New Testament. Jesus to them is a heretic. He, he, he got what he deserved, okay? He was a blasphemer and a heretic, and he got the punishment that he deserved. So they reject all of the New Testament and even the possibility that Jesus could be uh, their Messiah. So they only accept the Old Testament. The Hebrew Bible the Old Testament, is referred to as the Tanakh. And it was divided into three parts. The law, the prophets, and the writings. Okay, And I want you to look with me. Uh, back in Luke, we've, we've looked at this uh, passage uh, 
this section a few times. Look with me back in Luke chapter 24. Luke 24 and the verse 44. Once again, this is Jesus dealing with those disciples there uh, in Emmaus. And we get to verse 44, okay? And uh, it says, uh, and he said unto them, uh, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. This is actually the disciples he's uh, dealing with. Uh, that all things must be fulfilled. And then look very carefully. Jesus is careful to give the Hebrew division here, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. All right? So Jesus gives in that verse the three recognized divisions, the, the law, the prophets, and he uses the Psalms as representative of the writings, okay? Um, now, the law, you've probably heard this word before, uh, the Torah. How many of you have ever heard of the word Torah, okay? The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. We call it the books of Moses, or we call it often the Pentateuch, right? So that's, that's the prophet, that's the law, that, that first part. The law was given by Moses, okay? The second section is the prophets, and it's, uh, it's called in, in Hebrew the Nevi'im. The minor prophets are found in this section. Do we have that, um, we have that up there, um, that little chart thing? There you go, okay? So you've got the Old Testament scriptures. You've got uh, the Torah, okay, the five books. You've got the Nevi'im. And that's divided into the former prophets and the latter prophets. So the minor prophets fit in the prophet section, the Nevi'im, and they are considered to be in the latter prophets, okay? Latter prophets. Uh, now, interestingly, originally, the minor prophets were all put together in one book. And that book was entitled, The Book of the Twelve, okay? So it was one book. It had, it had um, you know, all together. It just, kept, it just ran together, the whole thing. Now, I got a, a kind of an interesting question. Does anyone know why they put it all together in one book and just, you know, there were, again, there was no chapter divisions and things like that. It just was written all in one book. It's a very practical reason. Any guesses? Save money, there you go. Printing costs. <laughs> No, that's practical. This one's, this one's really practical. Aren't there a couple of them that are really tiny, like Obadiah and Nahum? They were afraid that if they had individual pieces, scrolls or whatever, they could easily lose one of them. Wouldn't be hard if you had, you know, how many of you have had a big stack of paper? I mean, the Bible's a, it's a big stack of paper, right? And then you got like Obadiah or you got Nahum and then it just slips out and it's gone. So they put, originally put it all together in the same book because they did not want to lose one. Now, why, why? That's silly. Why is that important? Because we need to know that we have all of God's word. And we need to understand the care and concern that the Jewish people put into making sure, right? We know how they copied things down. But they wanted to make sure that we had God's word, okay? One of the greatest, th I mean, the, the Jewish people are a great people. One of the greatest things that they've ever done for the world is, is really care and take the time and preserve for us today the Holy Bible. Now, uh, so you have the, uh, the, the prophets, the latter prophets, and within that you have the, um, uh, the 12, the book of the 12, the minor prophets. One more time. And then we have the, uh, we have the writings, the ketuvim, okay? And that would be, all of the rest, okay? Poetic uh, wisdom books, uh, different scrolls, Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, and then, interesting, uh, note where Daniel is. Daniel's considered part of the writings, but not a prophet. That doesn't mean he's a prophet. It wasn't a prophet. That's just how they organized it. When we put our Bible, we put, you know, the prophets all together. We put it in a different way. Again, the um, Chapters and verses and chronology, those are not inspired. You don't have to worry, my Bible doesn't have it in the right place, okay? Uh, so, sometimes in the French Bible, chapters ended differently than in the English Bible. 
you, you, don't have to, you don't have to lose it. It's okay. Okay? We've got the word of God. Sometimes men categorize it better. Chapters and verses are there for our help, right? Imagine trying to ver- find a verse in the middle of Second Chronicles. You know, you're like verse number 1,716. Okay? Much better to have a chapter and a verse, correct? Okay, so, so, so that's for us. Now, uh, it, also another important thing that is, is to remember is that um, <clears throat> although the, the minor prophets are individual books, they are grouped together. And then finally, the term minor does not indicate they are less important, right? You know, like, I don't know, I just got, I'm in the minor leagues, right? I'm not in the major leagues, I'm in the minor leagues, okay? Uh, that's, not, that's not what it's about. Minor refers to, in general, these books are what? Shorter, okay? So, uh, you know, Isaiah wasn't like, you're just a minor prophet, right? They didn't do that. All of them, equally, okay? We're, we're, we're the less off if we don't have even one tiny book of the Bible, right? It's all scriptures inspired by God. All scriptures given by inspiration of God. It's all important. It's all to be brought together. And one is not important, more important than another, okay? So it's not that they're less important. It's the fact that, in general, they're shorter books. Now, um, I want to read something uh, for you for just, here, just a moment. This comes from a, a book that I've used to study. Uh, I've used a bunch of books, but this is one that just kind of uh, struck me. Um, this is from, uh, an, an author is John Phillips. Um, and he, his book is called Exploring the Minor Prophets. And he writes in the, in the preface of this book, he writes, um, let me make sure I got my right, the right reading I want to do. <clears throat> to understand the prophets, we must understand the calling and election of Israel. This specially favored nation is the only one with which God has made a treaty. God created Israel to be his nation and chose the Israelites to be his representatives to the other nations, his ambassadors to the world. The chosen people, as they are sometimes called, were ordained to be kings and priests unto God. All other nations were to be blessed by their contacts with Israel, for through her, they were to be brought into the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. To this end, God placed Israel at the world's geographic center. He gave the chosen people the most strategic location on earth. They were to dominate the Middle East. Their territory was to stretch from the Nile to the Euphrates. Had the Israelites remained true to their calling, And had they properly administered their vast land, it would have become the heart of a world empire and the center of spiritual blessing for all mankind. Now that goal will not be reached until the millennium. Israel's repeated failure, even to approximate this divine ideal, gave rise to the prophetic ministry in that country. So all of that to say, the reason we had these prophets was because God, once again, was long-suffering and patient. He called Israel out of Egypt. He built them, right? He created a great people of them. He gave them a land, and they failed in their responsibility toward him. But he didn't say, all right, you you failed once, it's all over. He sent these prophets again and again and again to remind them of their potential in God, right? Sent them again to remind them the great plans he had for them, what he wanted them to do for him, and how they would be blessed in doing it. And he did it again and again and again and again because he's a loving and long-suffering and patient God. And we'll read about that in Amos, how he did that, and how eventually he's going to run out of patience. Now, let's take a look at the introduction to Amos. Um, You can turn there. We find Amos 
Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, third prophet, okay, third in the minor prophets. You can turn there, I don't know that we'll get much into it, but let's talk first of all about Amos the prophet, okay, the little background to his ministry. Now, I mentioned earlier uh, in our lesson, I mentioned Elisha, okay, Elijah, and Elisha follows him. Amos is about 30 to 40 years after Elisha. And he prophesied during the reigns of King Uzziah, who was the king in Judah, and uh, King Jeroboam, Jeroboam II, actually, uh, in Israel. So let's read the first verse. The words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. All right? So about 30 to 40 years after Elisha, during the reign, uh, uh, both of these men, both Uzziah and Jeroboam, had lengthy, lengthy reigns uh, in their respective kingdoms. Again, when we talk about uh, Judah, we're talking about the southern kingdom, okay? The one that was eventually conquered by Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, okay? That's the B, remember? When we talk about the northern kingdom, we're refer we often use the word Israel, but in our context, the northern kingdom is called Israel. That's the one that Jeroboam I broke away from, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and they created their own kingdom, their own uh, place of worship, their own temples, their own, they created golden calves to, uh, to bow down to and offer to, and we'll talk a, a great deal about that as we go forward. And so they were the northern kingdom, Israel, they're the one that Amos is going to go to, they're the one that will eventually be destroyed by the nation of Assyria. That's the A, right? A first, then B. Northern kingdom goes first. Now, just an interesting side note. Again, we're always tying things together, okay? You're like, what does that have to do with this? Nothing except for our effort to tie things together. Amos 1.1. 1, 1. Look at the very end of that verse. Two years before the earthquake. What earthquake? Well, I don't know exactly what earthquake, but I do know it must have been moving because we find, if you'll look with me, in Zechariah chapter 14, Zechariah chapter 14, we find a reference to this earthquake. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, okay? So again, this, this is crazy. There was this earthquake during the reign of uh, Uzziah, okay? During the time of Amos. It was referenced by Zechariah 200 years later, okay? That, that, if we're talking about an earthquake 200 years later, we're talking about a pretty big tremor, aren't we? But he's also referring in that passage to the future times, to the tribulation and beyond. So in that one verse, we have a reference back to Amos' time. We have a reference to something that, uh, you know, he's preaching himself, Zechariah, and he's talking about an event that is far, far into the future. So again, you can find these things, tie them together, and also understand that this is what happens many times in the prophets, these references that are used again and again and referring to different time periods. Um, Amos was born and raised in Judah, okay? Uh, do you have, your, you have your map? If you have your map, uh, the, the really colorful one, not the pinky one, the other one, okay? So again, if you've got this map, you can see green is Israel, the northern kingdom. Purplish is Judah, the southern kingdom. And you can see south of Bethlehem, does everyone see Tekoa? Right here. Right here. Kind of in the north of Judah. Okay, Tekoa. That's where uh, Amos was born and raised, okay? It's about six miles south of Bethlehem, and it's on the edge of the wilderness, the Judean wilderness. Um, it's the western side, as you can see on that map. It's the western side of the Dead Sea, okay? 
There's an area of, of, of wilderness, uh, barrenness, and things like that. We uh, see in the Old Testament, and then another uh, time in the New Testament, several times, uh, that John the Baptist was the voice in the wilderness, right? The voice speaking out in the wilderness. That's the wilderness. That's where people went. He was out there, you know, where he was out there having his locusts and wild honey, right? And people went out into the Judean wilderness to see him. Jesus said, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? No, they went out to hear the message of John because many people realized this was the one promised in the prophecy of Malachi. It was also where Jesus went to be tempted. It says, does it not? It says that he went to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So this was a pretty rugged area that this guy was from. He wasn't from the big city. Now what's interesting, again, as I mentioned to you, he's going to the big city. Okay, he's from like, you know, up in Capus Casing on his way to Toronto or something like that. Okay, this guy is not from there. All right. So he's uh, from Tekoa, out on the edge of the Judean wilderness. Now, interestingly, uh, this is also the area where, uh, how many of you know the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found at Qumran, okay? That's, that's in the uh, desert there, right along the, the, the uh, Dead Sea and the caves that were there. So that region, it, uh, there's a lot of things that, that took place there, and it's associated with a lot of important things uh, in, in Bible and in Jewish history. Now, um, the scriptures, as we read in verse number one, say he was among the herdmen of Tekoa. So he was uh, a shepherd, okay? He kept sheep out there in that wilderness. Uh, and most likely, you know, uh, most Jewish young men did what their father did. Our Lord did, right? Our Lord's father, Joseph, his earthly father, was a carpenter. And so he was brought into that trade and learned that trade. Most likely, Amos was a shepherd because his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather, they were shepherds, okay? Uh, but he was also a gatherer of sycamore fruit, okay? And um, the sycamore, is, it's a species of fig, uh, but many Bible commentators note that it's a poor quality fig, and often it was a food that, you know, more sophisticated people didn't eat. It was more a food that was for the... Um, uh, you know, poor type people, okay? Uh, it provided uh, food for them, a fruit for them, okay? Um, and, and the idea of gatherer, uh, also included in that in the Hebrew is a cultivator. So he was a herdsman and a cultivator and gatherer of this sycamore fruit. Uh, again, once again, a country boy, humble origin, uh, humble family, uh, very little education. But if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter one in verses 26 and 27. Uh, I won't turn there for time, but it talks about uh, the fact that not many noble, not many mighty are called, right? Uh, you know, God, God has his Pauls and he has his Charles Spurgeons, but they're the exception. And we can't allow the fact that we're not, you know, if I was Paul, I'd be a great preacher. If I was, you know, Spurgeon, I'd be telling people about the Lord. No, God created us just the way he wants us to be for his work where he has placed us. And it's important for us to understand that. Most Christians are just average, ordinary people, and praise God for it. He had a secret preparation. We're going to see that this man was powerful in the things of God. He preached with spirit-filled words. Where in the world did he get that? He had some kind of secret preparation. I assure you, when he was out there with the sheep, or as he was, you know, I imagine cultivating or gathering sycamore fruit isn't the most exciting thing to do. You know what he was doing lots of times, I'll bet? Well, he was memorizing the scriptures, or he was, you know, uh, talking to God, praying, saying, God, use me. Do something with me. I, I'm your servant. Help me reach people for you here. Many had secret preparation. Forty years for Moses on the backside of the wilderness. Gideon. He comes out of nowhere. Uh, Daniel, uh, you know, he just starts, he's a, he's a young man. Boom, he had some pretty good training before he got to Babylon. Paul, three years, I, I went up to Arabia. Three years he spent in the desert of Arabia uh, learning from God. John the Baptist, what did he do? Where did he get his from? He didn't go to university. So many of these people, many great people of God, 
ha had secret preparation. Let's look quickly now at the uh, at our introduction. <clears throat> um, it's about four or five minutes till. Um, we'll we'll start into it. Okay, I won't go. I won't go much further. Um, the book of Amos. Okay, what do we take for a theme for the book of Amos? Well, a good theme for it is a call for justice and a warning of judgments. A call for justice and a warning of judgments. A, a lot of what Amos deals with is, um, yes, he deals with prophecy, and yes, he deals with things that are going to happen, but a lot of things that Amos deals with is just telling people to do right. Just do right. Stop, stop robbing people. Stop treating the poor wrong. Stop oppressing people. Stop being wicked, okay? Uh, a call for justice, a call for doing what's right. A and then it's filled with warnings of judgment. And again, patient judgment. We're going to see there's the opportunity for repentance. But instead of the people uh, embracing it and turning back to God, the people turn on Amos and call him names and tell him to get out of here and tell him he's just, he's just a fool. And so, you know, God gave them another opportunity, and they rejected it again. Look with me in Amos chapter 5, and we'll take for a theme verse for this book, Amos chapter 5 and verse number 24. But let judgment run down as waters. There's the idea of judgment again, and righteousness, or we just spoke a moment ago about justice, and righteousness as a mighty stream. Boy, that is a that is a verse that's worthy of meditation. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. All right, it's 6 o'clock, and again, I said I'm going to be uh, respectful of your time, so didn't quite get all I wanted to get done, but that's, that's not a problem. Um, now, I want to remind you uh, of a couple things. Uh, we will, um, we were just working out this week the different um, mechanism. Of course, Pastor Jesse was gone the last couple days. Um, we will be getting the um, um, lessons. They're being videotaped. They're, they'll be up on YouTube, okay? And uh, we're going to work out a mechanism to get links to you. So if you miss a week, you know, you'll be able to find it there. Uh, if you want to rewatch something, a certain part or something like that, it'll be, able to, it'll be available for you. <coughs> and um, we're, again, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, work that out and, and you know, make, that, make that known to you, how you can get to those. And then um, there is no class next week. We're going to be on spring break. I'm going to be down in, I'm going to be down in Texas, okay? Um, and um, so we just figured, you know, we had a good introduction so far. When we get back, we're going to jump right into Amos. So we won't have class next week. That'll give you an opportunity to review your materials from the first two weeks. Um, that'll give you a chance that you can feel free, uh, even, while, even while I'm gone, be happy to. Uh, go ahead and send questions, okay, so that we can... Uh, you know, get you right on where you want to be to go to jump into Amos, and then continue reading the book as often as you're able to. Okay, if you can just you know read, if you just keep up with the one chapter that we're doing, that's that's okay. But if you've got some extra time and you can slowly read through it again and again, like I said, each time you go through it, you're going to get a little bit more, and then each class we have, you're going to have even a little bit more that you can add to that. Okay, and so those would be really good ways that you could. Uh, prepare and be ready uh, for our next class in two Sundays, okay? So we'll start uh, next week. We've got a few more introductory points to Amos, and then we'll uh, jump right into um, that, all right? You are dismissed, and if anybody has questions right now, if you want to stick around and you want to ask me any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. If, if you missed any of, the, uh, any of these things, maps or anything that has to do with